All right, so we're starting our podcast today, um, Brockton to Beacon Hill, and I have a very special guest, and I would like you to talk about yourself, Ash, and I'm not going to attempt to say your last name, because I, I probably don't even know how to say your first name, so we'll start by introducing yourself, let us know um, who you are, and what your assignment has been with the office, and uh, just tell us a little bit about yourself. Awesome, thank you. Uh, so my name is Ashish Krishna, and uh, I am an undergraduate student at the University of Massachusetts, Boston. Uh, I'm currently majoring in economics, minoring in public policy. So this work opportunity at Rev Mendes' office is perfect where both, the, both my areas of studies meet. And uh, so far at, at the State House, my work has uh, mainly been on AI research and responsible use of AI, and I have been tasked to come up with a proposal for AI regulations for the state of Massachusetts, uh, where, which I'm very excited to discuss about with the representative. And that is a huge, huge topic because I feel like legislation is always behind technology. We're always <clears throat> catch up. So there's a lot more that we can be doing that we should be doing and that we must be doing. But it always seems like that technology finds a way to be so much more advanced. And it takes us time to even understand uh, what is going on out there and what the danger is. And so this is why I think it's just so crucial. And now you have um, a presentation for us that I love to hear. It's so many great stuff, but it's also so many concerning stuff that we should really be aware. And it's uh, up to us at the legislature to be aware of these things and to come up with regulations to protect, especially the younger generation that it, there's so much more advanced with technology. I'm here just still trying to play with the Zoom and trying to make everything work. And um, the younger population is just so much ahead in advance. So this is why I think this um, whole proposal and your research and everything that you've been doing at the State House is so crucial. So you ready to begin? Absolutely. I appreciate that. Let me just share the screen and that way uh, you'll be able to start talking about your research and all the amazing stuff that you've been learning and doing and working with and then you can also tell us your your next projects what have you been up to because you're going to be finishing your semester and exactly doing amazing stuff we love to hear all about it but awesome <laughs> so all let's right. begin let's talk about ai so what have you learned so well, my presentation is uh, about regulating generative AI in uh, Massachusetts. So here at the introduction, uh, we could see, we talk about artificial intelligence technologies uh, as they continue to advance in a rapid pace, just like you said earlier. Uh, and it's so hard to catch up and uh, regulate them at the same pace. So today we'll pretty much uh, look into regulation of content uh, of generative AI and more morally focus into deep fakes and and uh, basically generative AI. And our approach to this uh, legislation is compromised from the European Union's AI Act which is uh, one of the biggest regulators in the world. And uh, they just came up with this Artificial Intelligence Act to regulate AI. And uh, we're, we're gonna look into that. And so, I think this is so important because here in the United States, apparently you looked it through other states and the regulation from the European Union so far is mm -hmm. what it's been most advanced to this point. So it was interesting that you had to look out of the United States, outside of our country to see what other countries are doing, what other places are doing, because we're all playing catch up. We're all trying to understand how to properly uh, address uh, making sure that people are using technology, but also uh, in a safe manner, in a, a legal manner, in, in a way that it's not causing 
more harm, which it was not what it was intended for. It was intended to do great things, but in the wrong hand, it can do terrible things. So it's interesting that you had to even look beyond the United States um, to do that. So, all yeah. right. <laughs> So, so yeah, uh, the European Union, uh, they have been working on this act for a long time. And though we have a few legislations in the U.S. and different states uh, passed and some of them enacted, like California, Colorado, Texas, uh, there is nothing as complex and comprehensive as the one in the one in Europe. So let's uh, let's look at, at the overview of generative AI. So what is generative AI? So this refers to a subset of artificial intelligent technologies that have the ability to create new context aut autonomously. Um, these can be generated, uh, these are uh, contents like images, text, audio, and other forms of data that pretty much like mimic human-like behavior. So applications of generative AI, Gen, Gen AI has a wide range of uh, applications in different industries. Uh, it goes from like art design uh, to all the way to finance and other complex industries. So you, you can see the use of AI in industries like uh, movies, like right now the CGI, uh, they are really developing uh, AI to make better CGI's for movies. And there's also a big concern of this replacing people's jobs in a lot of uh, different sectors. Yes, I do think that AI really helps um, in different industries, but as to replacing the, the human piece of aspect, I think it's gonna be a long way because I do know in uh, politics or in judicial to write briefs and to write speech, sometimes, it seems like the technology makes up what you want to hear and <clears throat> convey the message. So you all always, at least at this point, need that human being to fact check and making sure that the information and that the cases and that the things that it's cited to is, is actually there, that it's not just somehow made up. So I also feel that it's going to be, it, 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 there's a, a scare that yes, it may be getting rid of some jobs, but I think it's gonna be a long way and we're always going to need the actual human being, the person to go through and check the information, at least while the technology is still being developed. So I'm, I'm thinking it's still gonna be a long way, but it's definitely a different way to, uh, when you're going to college to prepare the next generation of um, people that are gonna come to the workforce to make sure that they have the qualifications to go beyond the technology and to understand the technology and to make mm -hmm. sure that the technology is using, is being used for our benefits. And I, I do think that we're always going to need, maybe in a different way, but industries will still be needing the human being, the person to vet it, to check, and to making sure that technology is working how it's supposed to be. So, so hopeful that it's going to change, but not completely eliminate. But yeah, this, this yeah, is on, on the contrary, we can also see that it will bring in a lot of new jobs, uh, like, you know, various jobs related to AI. But that, again, will require a lot of human training and all the industries uh, will have to start training people with all the new skills that will be required for these new jobs created by AI? Um, the mechanics, you know, before it was just like working with the cars, not much more involved. Now there's so much technology involved uh, in the new cars. And so just being a mechanic, you need to know so much about computers and, and the system there because now everything is just... Uh, it changed so much the field. So yeah, it'll definitely need require a lot of training, but. I, uh, yeah, I think this is uh, like we're in the time where it's kind of like the revolutionary stage of the world when it comes to AI, because this is, I feel like the period when, uh, back when the internet was first introduced and World Wide Web, people just thought, what is this new thing? You know, nobody's gonna ever use it. And then here we are in a day and age where without the internet, we possibly couldn't do most of our daily jobs. 
Yes. So I do think we touch a little bit on the benefits of uh, AI. Do you want to address a little bit of the risks? Yeah. We touched a little on it, but maybe go a little bit deeper in, yeah. into some of the risks Sorry. of AI. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, so there's potential for misuse, such as creating deepfakes, uh, deepfake videos for deceptive purposes. We will see uh, more realistic scenarios of this case uh, going forward. And there's also ethical concerns uh, related to copyright infringement and uh, intellectual property rights. So there's, which basically means there's concerns of people uh, trying to generate from AI uh, the work of pe real people doing uh, work, for example, books and music. We've seen this happen lately uh, where people use AI to mimic other artists and create their own music, but in the voice of the artist. So that's another risk. And there's always the risk to privacy and security, particularly when generating synthetic data with uh, personal information. So there's al always a uh, risk for, you know, the people. Deep... Yeah, go ahead. The, the deep fake is um, so real that it's scary. Even in the presidential primary election just this year, that uh, there was a robocall pretending to be president, um, Biden saying, telling people not to bother to go vote because the primary wasn't the real election at the general. And it was just so concerning. So that could go both ways. Maybe um, some politician that is running for office, maybe they did say whatever it is that they said, but then it's background. They could say, oh no, that wasn't me. That was deep fake. I never said that. And, and the opposite could be that they <clears throat> definitely did not say it, but then it comes out if it was them and their voice. And then now they're, they're spending that time in their campaign trying to prove that, no, that wasn't them. They never said that. So it could go mm -hmm. both ways. So that is very concerning. That's one of the things that I've been watching and looking and seeing, and it looks so real and other people are using it to uh, say a family family member was kidnapped and then they need money and they at risk and then using it to uh, pretend to be that person asking for help. And then the other family member ends up paying uh, the hostage. So it, it just gets to be criminal and it gets, people get creative and it gets to be worse and there's no limit unless we really have our tools and resources to be able to identify uh, where these people, where that's coming from and who's doing that, which is super hard to identify because we don't even know if they're in the country. Uh, where where are they and, and how is that is being done? But I've seen, I've seen terrible stories already. And this is pretty new technology and it's just already been so concerning. So yes, uh, definitely something to even even more concerning uh, by the pace of it develops every single day. You know, it's uh, pretty scary. <laughs> yes. So how are we doing in Massachusetts? How we feel <laughs> our laws is so far and. So in Massachusetts, uh, this is an interesting thing that I was going to talk about later, but I'm just going to bring it up uh, really quick, is that we ha actually have a bill that's proposed, and it's uh, written by AI. It's a bill to regulate chat GPT, but it's written by chat GPT. Uh, so it's really interesting. We'll look into that uh, later on. But in Massachusetts, uh, well, we're known for the vibrant tech industry and academic institutions. We have so many universities uh, in the state alone, and it's definitely a hub for AI innovation and research. So generative AI technologies are increasingly being developed and deployed across various sectors in the state. Especially, uh, I'm not sure if you've seen, but uh, there's this company called Boston Dynamics and they work on robots. And just the, I think just last week, I saw uh, they were at the state house uh, with their, I think it was like a dog, but a robot and they were playing around with it. If it's just mind blowing, honestly, to see the development and how forward they've come with uh, AI robots. So I must say, I took a tour at their facility and they showed me, they let me play with the um, 
the robot dog. So I was able to play with it. And there was robots all over the place. And it was just an amazing place um, to be. So I, yes, I, I absolutely know about them. They're doing phenomenal work. And it's amazing to see all the great things they're doing with their robot. They're really the number one. They're really awesome. So yes, Massachusetts, we are the right place to be able to come up with these regulations and be ahead of the things. I know if we're really ahead because it just seems like technology is always going to be ahead and we're always playing catch up. But the faster that we can get this done, the 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 more, the better it is for our society, for people to be safe and to, for people to know there's consequences. They can't just be uh, doing this stuff thinking that it's a joke, that it has real life consequences. And there should be uh, punishments for that and ways to identify who's, who's doing it and have the technology in place to actually uh, identify that. So yes. Um, so we, we've been talking quite a bit about the concerns. So I think mm -hmm. that really does uh, addresses a little bit why it's so crucial that we regulate AI. And if you want to. Yeah. So we definitely have <laughs> a need for regulation uh, in AI. So the rapid advancement of generative AI necessitates uh, proactive regulatory measures to ensure it's responsible and ethical use. And uh, regulation can mitigate risks associated with AI, uh, AI misinformation, privacy violations, and other potential harms like we talked about. And uh, we need to establish clear guidelines so we can foster innovation while still safeguarding the interests of consumers and business and society as a whole. Yes, and then the deep fake concerns we addressed a little bit regarding the manipulation of you know, political speeches and, and in elections, but that to me is um scary. So so yeah, this is where it gets pretty scary. You're you're not you're not wrong. So let's see a couple of uh, examples of the deep yes. fake controversies that's uh, happening around the world. So one of them is uh it's it's it, it's a manipulation of the political speeches. So in 2019, uh, the Speaker of the House, uh, Nancy Pelosi, uh, one of her videos was surfaced uh, on the internet where she, she seemed to be slurring her words or she seemed pretty intoxicated, which turned out to be AI. And uh, that was that was a really wake up call for <laughs> regulation. <coughs> Sorry, and. Uh, we can also see this happen uh, with election interference. So in 2019, uh, presidential can uh, election in, in Gabon and a deep fake video emerged uh, showing the current president delivering a speech after suffering a stroke. So this is where election interference uh, through AI can be dangerous because uh, this video turned out to be AI and it falsely promoted that the president is in good health while he was still in the hospital. Mm -hmm. And in India too, we see a lot of uh, deep fakes, fall information, false information going around and uh, targeting the opposition parties uh, and creating deep fake videos to kind of throw off the public, and especially in, in countries where, uh, especially like third world countries, this is a really dangerous thing because people don't have access to a lot of things. And if they just see a video pop up of the opposition party, it's more more than likely that they will end up believing that it's true and that can definitely uh, interfere with the elections. That That is um, very true because here in the United States, I think that people, they're savvy enough to go um, dig a little bit deeper and they're hearing so much about AI and deep faith that maybe if it's so unbelievable, they'll, they'll second guess and they'll question it. They'll probably dig a little bit deeper, but some third world yeah. countries where you see the person, you hear the person, it sounds like the person, it looks like the person why is it not the person? Now you're trying to make me believe that you never said that when I'm clearly seeing that it's you and it's you. So it becomes really that um, that concern and that could completely change the result of an election. It completely change. Um, it just can make the whole society 
um, be rebellions against whatever it is that so this is very easy for this technology to fall in the wrong hands and to really make a huge mess out of that um, country and that society. So I think it's also our responsibility in the United States to be mindful of what is going on in other countries and to ensure that democracy prevails. And, and we see uh, the war in fights, but there's also another war happening in technology. And that's also another way to look at it that we need to also have that responsibility mindful that we need to ensure that other countries are able to be safe and to have a democracy and, and to be able to not be led, misled. Mm -hmm. and, and I don't know how we can do that, but it, it's very concerning. Of yeah, all just to, just to add on to the election interference uh, controversies, right? Uh, so in Slovakia, we actually see how it actually, uh, a deep fake audio. So this was during their uh, previous elections and it was a very it, it was a very close election uh, it was pretty pretty much equally distributed and uh, so this was between a pro uh, Russia candidate and a pro Western country candidate in Slovakia and uh, a deep fake audio circulated uh, regarding the pro Western candidate and that actually turned the election where the pro-Russian uh, candidate won the election marginally. And people say that that audio had to had to do a lot with the turn in favor of the election. Exactly. Right on point. So so we if this is just the beginning. So we definitely need to understand this technology now and see how we can um, address it right away. Yeah. So we we could uh so when we look at the AI uh election so basically how AI can be involved in elections so there's definitely a risk reward dynamic where it it can be beneficial and uh, it can reduce campaign costs <coughs> through targeted advertising and also poses risks including spread of misinformation like we talked about uh, which could influence election outcomes. And there's uh, deep fake concerns, which we, which we just talked about uh, in Slovakia. And uh, there's also misinformation tactics, like we addressed the situation in India. So there, there are some uh, measures we can take against, <coughs> I'm so sorry, my throat is uh, giving me a hard time. This so, is changing all the time. So I think we all, <coughs> during this time of the year, all get a little bit of, <laughs> it changes every five minutes. It could be a nice day out now. And then once you get out, it's already um, cold and windy and rain today. And and yeah, we're well, not snowing. So we're happy. Getting, getting used to the Massachusetts weather is definitely. Uh, and you're easy. from <laughs> India. So it's nice and warm. So you don't I have know. to fluctuate yeah. in um, weather. It's just like in Brazil, and nice and warm as well. So it's, mm -hmm. I've been here for almost 30 years and I'm still trying to get used to it, so. <laughs> well, that, that tells me I'll take longer time. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's in our DNA. I don't think it ever happens, but. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's just hope so. <laughs> so let's talk about some of the regulations as you were saying. Um, I know at this point it's very weak, but where where are we in in light of all this technology and the concerns? So how are we doing so far? So some states have uh, enacted and proposed uh, AI related laws, particularly regarding elections, because everybody is worried about it and uh, don't want it to affect our elections, which already is so tense in the United States. And there's also a lot of corporate initiatives. Uh, AI companies have pledged to combat AI's uh, potential negative impacts on elections, acknowledging their responsibility in preventing the spread of misinformation. And uh, there's also concerns about uh, accountability. Uh, so there's a debate regarding uh, who, who's responsible, right? So uh, 
there there are some people who are saying the AI companies who create these uh, platforms should be held responsible for the spread of mis misinformation. Then there's the other half of people who think the social media platforms who facilitate these uh, disinformation, uh, they think that they should be the ones held accountable. So it's still an ongoing debate. We could always uh, try to point it to both of them and say, you shared the responsibilities of what's on your platform and what you create. So that's a debate that's still ongoing. And I think that's going to be a very long debate because that's uh, a very hard question. I do think that uh, both would share the responsibility, like you said, because the AI companies, when they are still developing the software, I think they're they're trying to beat the other company, beat the competition. So whoever comes up with this stuff the fastest is probably going to be the one uh, dominating the market. But on the other hand, they are not worried as much with the concerns, with the issues, with the ethics, with the responsibilities and all the things that it's involved to create this, this software in a safe manner. And then the social media companies, the platforms, they're like, well, whoever is putting this stuff, they are the ones responsible. We can't be the ones um, regulating everything that it's on our platform. But it is because they're putting information out there and they're putting information out there as if it's true and reliable. And now that information that it's being put on because they have ways that on your feed, you'll be seeing that stuff. So however, the 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 algorithm and the the crazy words, they'll they'll find ways and they'll they'll start feeding in um, to that particular you know, demographics of people of that information. So that's completely uh, can manipulate with an election as it's, if it's a close call, a close election, <clears throat> they'll they'll be able to just start seeing all that information if they're thinking it's all true. People are not going to take the time to fact check everything, to look and, and so they both share responsibilities. It, it has uh, to be uh, that way. The social media platforms, they're usually pretty quick to address this freedom of speech whenever it benefits them. So it's going to be a big debate for sure. So what is this gem Gemini? <laughs> so Gemini, uh, really controversial. Uh, so it's Gemini is Google's AI model. It's Google's chat GPT, if you want to put it that way. So it's a creation of Google, an AI model designed for various tasks, including generating images and text. So they came, uh, they had to address some accuracy issues. So despite its amazing capabilities of uh, being a great chatbot, uh, Gemini faced criticism for generating inaccurate images, uh, indicating a gap between intended output and actual results. So this, this was a really controversial thing because uh, once it was uh, released, so people started to play with it uh, as right now people do with every new AI that comes out. Uh, so in Gemini, the allegations were of racial bias initially, where individuals suggested a skewed representation in the generated content. So one of them was like falsifying historical figures of race. So. Basically, I think somebody tried to ask Gemini uh, to generate a picture of the founding fathers of America. And it, it, it only would generate uh, images of people of color, which is uh, factually wrong when, you, when it comes to founding fathers. And uh, there's also like, there was political bias and uh, uh, it, there seemed to be allegations of uh, Gemini pushing a woke agenda on, on its users. So if, if you would ask it, uh, ask Gemini regarding uh, any, anything related to wokeness, uh, it would kind of push the agenda on you rather than uh, take a neutral stand. So and like- we're like, talking about Google, which is, we're all used to just go on Google and search <laughs> everything and write everything and then it comes up a um, whole bunch of information on that topic. So how is this uh, different than what we've been doing all along, just doing the Google search and then also coming up with all that information on that topic? How is this Gemini project 
different than what we've been doing so far uh, with all the Google search that we do every single hour of the day because we ask Google everything. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> that's an excellent question because Google, as we know it, is a, it's supposed to be a search engine. We go in there, just ask it whatever we want to know in our daily lives, and it, it spits out a bunch of uh, and, uh, links, answers, and we kind of surf our way into the answer we, we're trying to look for. So Gemini, it, it, it kind of narrows down the process to where you don't have to look for the stuff. It just spits out what it thinks is the best response for your question. And that is based whoever the the creator of that software is. So that is based on one person's or a group of people's agenda towards what they feel. The so that's that's been manipulated because when you just do a Google search, then you have to go through the steps of reading it, see how relevant it is to your topic, and go through it, and then you compile all that information to make your own and your message and what you want to come out of that research. But what we're seeing with the Gemini, it gives you that answer, supposedly does it for you, but it it's it's not doing such a great job as we see it. Because uh, it's, it's not factually correct. And it, it has the race fires. It has a whole bunch of issues attached to it. And Google is, is this big company that we think knows everything. Like we just Google for everything. And to get it so wrong, is it's just it just shows us how how concerning this whole thing is because we trust Google when we do our, our Google search because that's how we've been doing out along. But now when it comes to AI, not even Google can get it right. So it's like- no, Google, Google has been in a lot of hot water uh, when it comes to their AI stuff because a long, long before uh, Gemini, Google came up with uh, Google Photos, something I still use to the day. And so in Google Photos, when they first came up with it, they used AI to do facial recognition. So if you have a bunch of pictures in your gallery, it will uh, recognize the faces and it will categorize people for you. So if you want pictures of uh, your dog, it will show you all the pictures of your dog in, in your gallery. So it kind of segregates uh, pictures uh, through individual personalities. And they were in hot water for this uh, because there's a situation called the gorilla situation. Uh, it was a big controversy where uh, where all the people of color in Google's uh, Google Photos they would they got categorized uh, as gorillas, which was really concerning, really wrong. And uh, Google had had a long time to uh fix that and make it right and now here we are with gemini and it's the total opposite it just refuses to uh generate images of white people so they do have a lot of a lot of problems going on in google that they need to address and uh like you said the creators uh they have the freedom of implementing their agenda on the AI model. So that needs to change. I think uh, the CEO of Google and the parent company Alphabet, Sundar Pichai, he came out and addressed the concerns relating Gemini, where he said uh, it's totally unacceptable and uh, they're going to fix it. So we're looking forward for them to fix it, as even right now, uh, Gemini does not uh, generate any pictures as they're still working on it. They have a lot of work ahead of them. So I do think we touch um, quite a bit on the concerns and the misinformation and the risks. And how can we prevent these stereotypes and, and biases that we're seeing in this technology? How can we do yeah. that? So firstly, we could do that by reinforcement learning from human feedback. Uh, you touched on that earlier a little bit, saying human feedback is really important. So implementing a system where humans provide feedbacks on models and uh, refine AI's understanding and reduce bias. So that would definitely, um, that means humans should address to the AI on uh, not, not making biases because of stereotypes or to avoid stereotypes. 
And we can also do curriculum changes. So alternate, uh, altering the training data, our curriculum to expose uh, the model to diverse perspectives can mitigate biases. So we need to make sure it's exposed to all or most of the data out there so it can mitigate bias. Uh, and also we should encourage AI models to adhere to principles against biases and discrimination aids in promoting fairness and accuracy. Also prompt transformation. So this is where uh, if you type, so when you ask the AI something, or if you have to generate a picture of a dog, that's the prompt, right? So rewriting prompts before inputting, inputting them into the AI model allows for controlling the information and potentially mitigating bias uh, outputs. So if the AI companies, uh, they do prompt transformation where they rewrite the prompts once they receive it before it's actually gone to the AI, that could help uh, mitigate a lot of stereotype biases. Mm. Now let's talk about the European Union Act, the yeah. AI Act, because that is um, our intro. We we said you're trying to convince us that they're doing better. So what are they doing? Like, and <clears throat> address uh, these types of concerns. How would they advance at least in their regulations and attempting to? Yeah, so they are, I would start with saying it's not perfect, obviously. Uh, a lot of companies, uh, AI companies, stakeholders are not really very much impressed with it, but it still comes with a very strong framework that we uh, take into consideration for our proposal. So let's look into the key principles of the EU AI Act. Uh, number one is prohibition of certain AI practices. So this is AI systems designed to manipulate human behavior uh, or to exploit vulnerabilities such as uh, social scoring systems like in China, uh, which is prohibited. So we're not going to allow anything like a social scoring system that China has been uh, doing. And a lot of people have a lot of concerns, but they get to do what they don't want, I guess. Uh, and we also look into high-risk AI regulation. So high-risk AI systems must undergo conformity assessments, their transparency and documentation obligations. So high-risk AI systems are basically generative AI, like chatbots, deepfakes, uh, like ChatGPT and uh, Gemini, they all fall under the high-risk AI. And looking into transparency and accountability, it's uh, so this includes requirements for clear documentation, traceability, and uh, human oversight in deployment of AI systems. And then there's the regulatory oversight and enforcement mechanisms, uh, which basically states that we need regulatory bodies to enforce these uh, regulations on AI companies before they're deployed. I feel that this this is so much. It's just like a, a lot of work. So, um, how can we adapt these principles here in Massachusetts? Because I do understand we do have a pending bill on uh, deep fake, and then this this um there's bills pending in the legislature that we we absolutely aware and see and know that this is a problem and how can we do better how can we address it so what have you found so far how we're doing in Massachusetts yeah uh, so far I think uh, we need to uh, adapt some of the basic uh, very important principles standard for uh, Massachusetts so one of them uh, number one would be prohibition of harmful AI practices uh, just like the first principle states uh, of the EU AI Act. So no social, uh, no social scoring systems, they should be prohibited and uh, are taking uh, or storing data biometrics of individuals and uh, also malicious purposes such as defamation, fraud and manipulation. These, these are all uh, prohibited. And number two would be identification of high-risk generative AI systems. Uh, so similar to EU, uh, we should regulate to uh, identify and define high-risk generative AI systems so we can categorize them and regulate them accordingly. 
And next, we look into transparency and accountability requirements. Uh, this may involve providing clear documentation on training data, algorithms used, and potential biases for uh, our limitations for AI systems. And then obviously we, we do need a regulatory uh, oversight and enforcement. So we need a regulation body uh, assigned by the government or attorney general to look over uh, or enforce the regulations for AI. A lot of work that we have to do here. <laughs> And yeah. in other states too, and in other countries, we're really just scratching the surface here today. This is just mm -hmm. this is a, a topic that we could be here for weeks just talking about this, and we still yeah. would not be done. This is just so much. So really, today it's just this like brief overview of all the mm -hmm. the issues, the concerns, and the danger. Because once we identify that, then we know our challenges and what we need to address and, and how can we do that uh, in a safer manner, but also as quicker and as fast as we can, because if we just keep on playing catch up with the law, then 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 we're all in trouble. So it's, it's important to do this study and to look deep so that we can um, identify and see what the danger is and how society is at risk and address it uh, immediately as quickly as we can. Yeah, so yeah, you're absolutely right. And uh, also the collaboration with stakeholders is a really important thing while regulating for uh, regulating AI, because we always need the input of the industry. Uh, we need input from the stakeholders. So we don't uh, so we don't hinder innovation we, or we actually try to foster innovation rather than regulate them so much that they don't want to be innovative anymore. So that's a really important thing is collaborative, uh, collaborating with stakeholders. Definitely. And um, listening sessions and going to our schools and going to the professions and going <clears throat> to different industries and just making sure that uh, technology can still be relevant because if you regulate so much to the point that you can't really do anything because then what counts as um, deep fake is it all bad or, or um, the photoshops and the, the things maybe you're trying to do for your marketing so wh where's the line that it would still be allowed in order to be able to make your work easier and make technology work for you and make it quicker and faster but also safer so it is important because otherwise we'll have like a, a whole bunch of teenagers with the TikTok and being banned so it, it gets concerning when you because technology is part of our lives it is part of who we are we all have our phones we all have our technology with us and we're all using all the time so it's part of how we conduct ourselves so just take it away from us and not taking the time to hear from the community and people in the society and understand how all of that plays a crucial role in people's lives it would also be another mistake so that just yeah. adds up another well, uh, layer of concern of how um a situation this is like how we need to make sure we get this right and it's hard to get it right the first time unless we take the time to hear from people. Yeah, and we need. I think we need to uh, make sure it doesn't hinder innovation because that might also lead into a monopoly in the AI industry because that will stop or demotivate all the startup companies to you know start uh, start working on AI due to all these uh, horrendous uh, AI regulations that would impact them. So I think that's really important that we keep an eye on that. Yes. And what about the um, prohibition of harmful applications? You want to talk a yeah. little? So absolutely. So this is the uh, my proposal uh, idea for the or what I like to call the, the Generative AI Regulation Act. Uh, so I kind of have divided it into four sections. So the first section would be uh, prohibition of harmful applications. So under this, we see the Defect Prohibition Act, uh, which explicitly prohibits the creation, distribution, and dissemination of defect contents uh, intended to deceive or harm individuals of our society. So there will be penal penalties for uh, violating 
this law and which could include fines, imprisonment, uh, or both, or depending on the uh, depending on the depth of the uh, violation. And the other one would be Forgery Prevention Act. So this would make it uh, legal illegal to generate fake documents, credentials, or other falsifying materials using AI. And again, it would have uh, severe legal consequences if not followed. And the next section is high generative, uh, high risk generative AI systems regulation. So in this, we see the first act, which is high risk AI identification and oversight act. So this outlines the criteria for identifying high risk generative AI systems uh, and establishing a regulatory framework for their oversight. So this applies to all the gen AI, uh, like chat, GPT, Gemini, and Sora, all, all these uh, systems fall under this high risk category. And so the preventive measures for high risk AI development act, uh, AI deployment act, under this legislation, uh, develop, developers uh, of high-risk AI uh, systems must uh, obtain prior approval for regulatory authorities uh, before deploying their systems. And this will ensure the safeguards are in place to mitigate potential risks to society. And in the third section, we will see- the accountability, that is, that is um, big because Mm -hmm. we, we must have um, transparency in this area. So yeah, talk a little bit yeah. more about that. So transparency is definitely huge. So the first act would be AI Transparency and Documentation Act. So this law would mandate developers to maintain clear documentation on data sources, algorithms, and metho methodologies used in the training and deployment of their Gen AI softwares. And it also requires the provision of accessible and understandable explanations of how AI uh, content was created. So I think this is a, one of the most important uh, things we need. I think so too. So basically if something was created with an AI, it would be like a, a disclosure that says, this is AI generated, would that be? Yeah, uh, well, that is, that is, I think uh, it would be like, it would come under the AI Content uh, Verification Act. So this is where, uh, re where it requires platforms and users to implement mechanisms uh, to verify the authentic authentic authenticity of uh, AI generated content. So this is where you would require a watermark or digital signatures where it says this is this content is AI generated. And uh, yeah, that, that's the most important thing to resolve all these uh, deep fake concerns we're seeing uh, nationwide. The problem is sometimes the fine line is so small that people, they when they're on their social media, they go through the slides and the feeds and the, so quickly that it's like second, there's not even milliseconds. It's just like very fast that they're just going through that. So it really takes that training for people to be more mindful, to be looking for these signs. Because even if the regulation is there, even if they're putting in there, these, these companies are so clever that they do it like so, so small and such a fine line that when you're just going it through it so quickly, because everything just happens so fast, you're not looking and you're not paying attention you're not mindful of the these smaller details and and it just takes up uh, our think, responsibilities too to to look mm -hmm. at that and to train for that and to let our kids know that this is how when when you cite your work when you're doing your you have to look you yeah. know it's credible and you're looking for that source I think it's similar here too that you have to be looking for that too because we also have our own share of responsibilities as consumer of these content to to not be misled to also be looking to to see if the information is credible yeah i'm glad you brought that up because i think this is where uh the social media platforms are held or uh, should be held responsible because one of the things uh or one of the platforms is X or formerly known as Twitter. Uh, I think they do a uh, really good work in this uh, problem that you just addressed is what they do is they have this thing called reader's notes. 
So any post you see, if it's AI generated, Twitter actually informs you below the post saying this content is actually AI generated and uh, it will have that note up there. So I think all social media platforms like Instagram, Facebook, uh, uh, others should definitely uh, implement the same tactics to tackle this uh, misinformation problem with AI. And next we look at the regulation to eliminate AI bias. Uh, definitely important uh, because we looked at the problems with Gemini. So this law mandates the development and implementation of algorithms and practices aimed at detecting and mitigating bias in generative AI systems. So this requires regular uh, audits and assessments to ensure that AI technologies do not uh, perpetrate existing biases based on factors such as race, gender, socioeconomic status, and nationality, and other stuff like that. That can only happen if who has a seat at the table can reflect the different backgrounds and race and color and gender, because other than that, it's just very hard to eliminate the AI bias if the people that are generating this technology, uh, the, if yeah. they don't come from those different backgrounds and if they don't have those lived experiences, is is much harder. So the more we can train mm -hmm. professionals and people to be able to have a seat at the table and to be able to collaborate as this technology is forming and it's being developed and it's being um, put out there in society, that we must find a way to make sure that all these voices are being heard, uh, whether it's the stakeholders, the listening sessions, and how we're making sure that we're validating all of that information and put it in the system to reflect uh, an outcome that it, it's not... Yeah, as yeah, horrendous yeah. as we've seen so far, and and it's a big challenge and a big task. So, yeah, hopefully, hopefully we'll see the first uh, tackle of that problem through Google, and uh, Jim and I will see what they do. All right, so so connection to the EU AI Act. Uh, so I think by aligning our regulations with the EU AI Act, we promote consistency and interoperability in AI governance. Uh, so this is very important. So we could actually align our uh, regulations globally as uh, it would benefit it would benefit the uh, AI developers if globally we all kind of align on the same regulations so they don't have to worry about different countries, different regulations. Uh, I think that's why it would be really helpful to have a connection to the EU AI Act. And that makes sense because um technology and internet and social media, it does not really has a, a border or a line that it's only in the United States. We're all connected. We're all globally connected. Um, mm -hmm. So if it's the laws that globally it applies, no matter where, <laughs> under which basement or whichever place the person is that is, is causing the act and is breaking the law and it's creating all of these, because they're always going to find a country, a, a place where those laws do not apply. So instead of being created here in the United States, where we're doing all this work that we're trying to uh, make it better, or in EU, EU, where they're like trying to work on this, but they're like, we'll send it to another place where uh, we could still be doing all these crazy stuff and nothing can happen. Mm -hmm. Your laws will not be applying to me here, yeah. but it will be impacting you. It will be affecting you wherever you are. So we're still going to be trying to interfere with your laws there, uh, with your elections in the United States or other parts of the, the countries and globe, but we won't have any of the punishments <clears throat> attached to it. So this is much bigger. I, oh, I don't sorry. even know where to begin, but it's it's a huge issue. We're looking at Massachusetts. How can we do better in Massachusetts? But on the other hand, how is this all, we're all connected? Yeah, I mean, I'm so glad you brought that up because uh, kind of related to do that, but on a different, uh, not related to AI, uh, it's basically still what's happening in India is they, uh, the government is trying to ask WhatsApp uh, that chatting app to decrypt all their messages 
to the government, which is, uh, I think, pretty, or on a world standard, it, it's pretty unacceptable because uh, it, it, it has privacy concerns, but they want to decrypt those and have it available for the government to, uh, their stand on it is to avoid terrorism and like, uh, people planning for terrorism, but uh, WhatsApp has stated that if they do regulate for uh, decrypting those messages, uh, they will have to pull out of India. So we'll have to see what, what happens on that court. It is um, so much in, um, I wish we could go deeper to all of these different topics because it, it's so amazing, it's so concerning and scary at the same time. So talk about this bill that is pending um, here yeah. in Massachusetts. So this bill, uh, S2539, uh, so this is an act relative to cybersecurity and AI. So I just wanted to talk about this bill because uh, I feel like we're touching a similar subject. I just wanted to uh, talk about how it, it might differ from what we just proposed. Um, so this bill is actually rewritten from the bill S31, which is uh, an act for regulating chat GPT and uh, other chatbots. And that, that was the act that I was telling you earlier. It was uh, actually generated by chat GPT. So that's an interesting uh, approach, I would say. Uh, so yeah, this bill basically aims to protect uh, Massachusetts residents from its potential threats posed by foreign adversaries uh, using social media and uh, to enhance electronic security for specific procurements uh, in involving cybersecurity equipment. So it, it kind of it's kind of a broader look into this uh, problem, and they also touch on topics for uh, with cybersecurity. But uh, here's we'll, here we'll see uh, the differences between uh, Gen AI Regulation Act and the Bill uh, Two Five Three Nine. So the proposed uh, Gen AI regulation focuses specifically on addressing deep fakes, uh, fake document generation bias mitigation and uh, transparency with generative AI. And like I said earlier, the bill uh, the bill uh, 2539 touches more broadly on the subject, but not uh, as specific to as where we are looking. So let's look into the benefits of the act that uh, was proposed is protection of individuals and uh, rights and privacy. Uh, promotion of ethical innovation and enhancement of public trust in AI technologies, alignment with international standards, like we uh, talked about being aligned with globally uh, in regulations with EU and other countries, and uh, mitigation of AI bias and protection against misinformation and manipulation. I think we touched on all these uh, earlier. This is just kind of like a summary of it. And we know it's really uh, much, much needed because so much work that, like I said, we're really, uh, the challenges is, is huge, especially because it's not just bound by here in Massachusetts, but globally and how this global society will all be affected in the same way. So yeah, the, the, the challenges is, is, is really, um, for us legislators to know we have this responsibility to keep uh, the society safe and the communities um, to be aware about our concerns and issues, but how do we address it? How can we make these laws uniform? Because each country will have its own piece of it that they will agree or not agree or, or that they think it should be happening or no, this is uh, going beyond of what we can, what we should, and and all of that. So <laughs> it's all mind blowing, and but it, it really it's a very important uh, conversation because it alerts us, it tell us uh, what we're dealing with and what it what we're getting into. All this whole technology, how it's great, but we want to make sure that we're safe and that we're using it the right way and using for 
the benefit of society, not to harm, not to overturn elections, not to uh, get dictatorship. And, and whoever has access to this technology will be able to manipulate the message to whatever they want to achieve the ultimate goal at that time. So almost a superpower um, you don't want anybody to have. <laughs> Yes, it's pretty much that superpower because in the wrong hands um, for all this technology, we definitely need to make sure that we uh, address it right away and we do what we can. Even if we have to start here in Massachusetts, start in other states and start um, getting the the samples that we're getting from the European Act, whatever we can do, we must start somewhere. And we're gonna not gonna get it right, but it's going we're perfecting as we go. And we, we keep at it. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. So uh let's uh, I just wanted to talk about a little bit about the challenges and considerations that comes with regulating AI. Uh, I think we touched on balancing innovation with regulation and how it might affect uh, startups and basically stifle uh, innovation if we over, over strictly uh, regulate AI. And the other would be addressing enforcement and monitoring challenges. Uh, so enforcing regulations and monitoring compliance. In, in the rapidly evolving field of AI it presents significant challenges. Uh, this is exactly what you just said. Uh, it just the speed of uh, the speed of the AI technology evolving is really hard to catch up for the legislators uh, on a on a daily basis. And we look into the ethical and uh, legal considerations. So legal complexities. Uh, including jurisdictional issues and international cooperation may arise in regulating generative AI technologies. And uh, there's also challenges of ensuring inclusivity and equity. So this kind of uh, talks about uh, how it is es essential to ensure that regulations do not uh, disadvantage certain stakeholders or there's no bias between stakeholders just so we're not working towards the profit of just one company. And uh, also adapting to technological advances. Uh, so regulations must be capable of accommodating emerging technologies and evolving threats uh, in the field of generative AI and uh, stakeholder engagement and collaboration. So this, I think we touched on uh, multiple times today uh, where the public engagement and stakeholders input is uh, really integral to the development of effective social responsible, socially responsible regulations uh, for Gen AI as uh, without the stakeholders, we would be in a mess and we would probably create more problems than solutions uh, for the state. The uh, public input is huge because the public is using this technology every day. So taking the time to to really um, have those listening sessions and having feedback and having people um, just being part of this process because this is so much engaged in our lives and part of our lives, part of who we are, part of we, how we conduct businesses. So it, it's just been an impressive <laughs> conversation Something that I really um, know almost nothing about it, but at, at least um, at least I've learned so much today and with our time together. And uh, it, it's just been amazing and all of our work. So what is next for you? So how do you see all of this? And Oh, uh, well, for me, uh, this was definitely one of the best experiences of my life, uh, working at this state I was working for you, uh, and especially researching on AI, uh, because I do love AI and everything it has to offer. So it was a really fun experience. Uh, going forward, I will be kind of pivoting into business school. So I am applying for business school. So this fall, I will be uh, going to where I do get ex accepted and uh, choose to go. So that that's kind of the next page of my life. Uh. 
Congratulations. So um, it's been an honor and a pleasure to have you at the State House and all the amazing work that you did there. And as you can see, it's it's a crazy place, crazy building. It's a whole bunch of moving pieces and different things that happens at the same time. So uh, your work was really your work. It was nothing that I gave it to you. And I, <laughs> I, I was really... Um, just hoping and expecting that you'd be able to uh, really do this research and come up with all of this amazing work and also the challenges and how we can do better. So how can we make sure that going forward, we can ensure our laws reflect our beliefs and reflect um, what we care and our values and our system and our culture and our society and how we make sure that our kids are safe and then our elections are safe and and that um I'm it was so timely, so timely because every time when you turn on the TV and, and all these different things happens, I knew you were right on it that you're working on it. So it's mm -hmm. it's a subject that we really just scratch the services so much, so much uh, to do. But uh, I'm I'm so happy that you join us. You're part of the team. For it goes by really fast. But um, I just want to say I'm really grateful for all your insights. Uh, for me helping with this uh, research and also the opportunity to work at the state house, really a once in a lifetime opportunity, at least for me, I'd say. And uh, I know uh, it was really an experiential or educational experience. Uh, where I got to see how everything works, uh, how how the policies are constructed. And I got to go to all interesting hearings and briefings. And especially the last week, the house session, uh, which was all a great experience. So I would, I really want to thank you for the opportunity. Good luck with your schools. Good luck with your studies. And thank you for accepting to put you on the spot and to have you talk about your research. But I really think this is the best way because so much work gets done at the State House. And we need to let people know uh, what is going on and how we're trying to address it. So it was so crucial. Thank you. Amazing job. And we'll definitely stay in touch. But yeah, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank too. you, everybody, who took the time to listen to our podcast today. We'll be back with some more amazing, um, amazing information for all your listeners. Bye. <laughs>